Well, welcome uh, to our meeting tonight at Chartridge on this beautiful spring evening. Uh, it's perhaps easy on a day like this or a time like this to praise the Lord, but it's, uh, he is good to us. And at this time of year, as you just look round, it's just so easy to remember that. We have uh, two readings from the Word tonight. Um, the first is from 1 Samuel chapter 8. That's 1 chap- Samuel chapter 8. Uh, we'll start to read at verse 4. And just go through to uh, verse 10. Although I'm sure Barry would say I should read the whole lot to give the (laughs) full context. But uh, we'll read just uh, just from verse 4. This is how Samuel is old and his sons are sinful. They do not follow in his ways. Uh, And Israel is demanding a king. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king like all the other nations. And this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge over us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, So they are doing to you also. Now therefore heed their voice, however you shall solemnly forewarn them, and show them the behaviour of a king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said to them, This will be the behaviour of the king who reigns over you. Oh, we know we'll leave it there. (laughs) Uh, you can uh, read that later if you like. We'll move on to our second reading in Revelation chapter 1. That's Revelation chapter 1, starting at verse 9. And we'll read through to verse 18. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom uh, of, and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos, for the word and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, of what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamonos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice of who had spoken to me. And as it, having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed in a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a gold band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in the furnace, and his voice had the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell on my feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I live forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys 
of Hades and of death. So as a nation, a country, we have uh, crowned a new king and uh, that has been very much the theme of this, this week and uh, this time. The people of Israel, uh, when we read about them in 1 Samuel, had never had a king before. Uh, they had uh, been made a nation by the Lord, uh, called to be a nation. He had appointed their leaders. He had uh, given them his word to live by uh, and the commandments. And uh, he had raised up leaders as, as necessary to guide them. And, uh, but they, they uh, were overrun by their enemies. They wanted uh, somebody who could liberate them from them. Uh, they wanted protection. They wanted to be like other nations, to have a king. And they made uh, this request. Uh, it was not really God's plan for them. He was their king. And uh, the reason they were in the situation they, they were was that they departed from his word and departed from uh, what he'd called them to be. But nevertheless, he gives them, uh, uh, provides them with a king and lets them go down uh, that road. Uh, their second king, King David, a man after God's own heart, did indeed make the nation great. Uh, he secured their borders, he uh, subdued their enemies, and uh, m made them a secure nation. His son, uh, Solomon, made them a wealthy nation, a nation that was looked up to and uh, very much uh, admired by those around. Uh, both men, sought to uphold the Lord, to honour the Lord. Uh, they sought to establish worship. Of course, they just uh, sought to build a temple. David was not allowed to do that, but uh, Solomon was allowed to complete that project. And uh, so they did complete the fact that God was central to them and uh, that their purpose of a nation was to uphold his name. Nevertheless... They were fallen men. They had their failings. And at the end of their days, both their stories are quite tragic. And it was downhill from then on. But the, uh, the prophets uh, promised them a king who would indeed fulfil their needs. One day they would have a Messiah. A Messiah who would really set them free. A Messiah who would be worthy of their worship. Uh, of their adoration, and be their great sa saviour, their liberator. And uh, they held on to that desire uh, through times of exile and through times of op oppression. Any uh, earthly king, any earthly monarch, uh, obviously will not be perfect. We're all fallen sinners. We're all weak, uh, men and women with our failings. And any leader is also going to uh, have his, their failings. Yes, there have been uh, good kings of this of England and bad kings. Oh, very, uh, but there's been no perfect <laughs> kings. They've all had their failings. But a king, a messiah was provided... It wasn't quite what they were expecting. Uh, when the Lord Jesus came, it wasn't in the circumstances they thought. And of course, they ended up rejecting him. But he was a saviour, and his king, as he reminded Pontius Pilate, his kingdom was not of this world. But one day he will, it will, he will, be, will be coming to reign. But I wanted uh, us to think tonight about Jesus, our King, and uh, some of his attributes, uh, Father, uh, as we look forward to the King who will one day come to reign. And uh, we look at this passage in Revelation, where the risen Lord Jesus is revealed to us. Uh, his faithful old Apostle John, uh, now 50 or 60 years on from the ascension of Jesus. Uh, John is uh, 
exiled on Patmos, a sort of Roman prison camp or labor camp. Uh, and there he has in this time of prayer, perhaps some think on the day of actual Caesar worship when uh, across the Roman world, Christians were having to make a decision whether they proclaimed Jesus as their Lord or, or Caesar as their Lord. We don't know, it just says on the Lord's day, whatever that means. Uh, but anyway, John has this opportunity uh, of prayer and in, within it he is given this vision and uh, the, the risen Lord Jesus meets with him. First thing I'd like us to note is this is a king that's in the midst of his people. We find Jesus in the midst of the lampstands. The lampstands that signified the church that was out carrying the light of Christ and Jesus is in the midst. We have a king that is with us and within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful, wonderful privilege. Kings of this world, many of them would perhaps seek to distance themselves from, from their people, would seek to protect themselves and uh, would have all the things like castles or thrones to give themselves status. Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, is with his people, however humble, uh, however lost they've been, he is there to receive them if they come to him in humility and repentance. He is with his church, with his people, whatever tribulation they're in, whatever circumstances. We note that uh, his dress here, here clothed with a garment uh, down to his feet, uh, girded about the chest with a golden band, uh, signifying royal, a royal robe, perhaps a priestly robe. Um, there can be debate on that, but of course Jesus is both those things, both our king, our priest. Also, there's a sense of a, a judge as well, a man of authority. And uh, Jesus is our intercessor, our high priest before the Father. Uh, but he also will be the one who, to whom we have to give account to, the one that we have to bow the knee to. Uh, one day we will account for our, for our actions before him. But uh, we read, uh, this, uh, his hair was white like wool, white like snow. Uh, Symbolic, uh, perhaps first of all, of purity. The brilliant white was taken as a, a symbol of purity. That Jesus is the perfect and the pure king in a way that no other could ever be. He walked this earth and lived a life on this earth that was perfect, that was sinless, that no other man or woman could ever have done. Uh, he was presented before the Father as a perfect sacrifice for our sin, an accepted sacrifice uh, that uh, atoned for our sin and he was risen from the dead because it was acceptable. Now he is uh, the perfect king, the king of absolute purity, absolute holiness. But it can also be taken as a... a, a display an eternity or, and uh, uh, Daniel's uh, man uh, uh, the same, very similar vision that he's given there is called the ancient of days uh, there's a sense there also of, uh, of perhaps of immortality eternity uh, also great wisdom uh, that, that's displayed uh, or symbolised within that and Jesus, of course, is uh, the eternal king. Even our, our late queen with her long and her good reign is it, uh, merely a tiny speck in the course of history. Uh, Jesus is the king that was uh, there before creation and whose reign will never end. The king of eternity. But also the king of... Uh, 
great wisdom or infinite wisdom as well. And uh, we read there and this, it has uh, feet uh, were like fine brass refined in the furnace. Brass was a maybe a symbol of judgment, but also a great symbol of a, a immu immutability sorry, immutability and uh, great wisdom that a judge would uh, need. Uh, the sense of uh, being completely uncorruptible, uh, the sense of uh, having great wisdom uh, as well uh, to make the perfect judgment. All, of course, characteristics of Jesus, uh, the perfect judge, the immutable source of wisdom, the uh, the om uh, well, the, the omnipresent, uh, the omnipotent, the uh, the all-knowing, the only one that can give a co that knows a complete picture, or that can give a, a, a perfect wisdom. Solomon, for all his God-given wisdom, uh, was a, a fallen man that made a well, he made very poor judgments sometimes, and of course uh, lost the plot completely. Uh, Jesus, his wisdom is perfect, it is complete, and his judgments uh, will be perfect, his commandments will be perfect in all that they are. Uh, we read his eyes are like flames of fire. Uh, Jesus is all, all seeing, nothing is hidden from his gaze, nothing can deceive him, no, uh, nothing false can stand before him. Uh, he, he and he alone has that perfect vision that sees the human heart, the human condition, exactly as it is. Uh, and uh, it, nothing, no deception, no work of the devil can uh, obscure truth before him. A voice that has the sound of many waters, uh, seen as a, giving a great authority and commandments, a voice that reaches across the world, uh, a commands that are absolute and that are powerful. Uh, when Jesus speaks, uh, of course, it is the word of authority, the word that must be obeyed. It goes on. Uh, what well, this... Yeah, we'll look at uh, in his right hand first, as it comes first. Uh, in his right hand, uh, he held the seven stars. Being held uh, gives a sense of security. It gives that sense of protection. If you are holding something in your hand, you're hold, trying to hold it secure. It is a place of safety. And... Uh, these stars, which are taken as, well, they're messengers to the churches, whether they're angelic messengers or whether they represent the pastors of the churches, it doesn't matter. Jesus holds us in his uh, hand. We are secure in him. Uh, what, uh, Peter, in his uh, first letter, speaks um, very much about being kept uh, by the Lord. Uh, um, and there it's a military term, like a sentinel guarding a position. If our lives are committed to the Lord, we are kept by him. We are secure in his hand. Uh, and these churches uh, and, uh, were secure that the Lord was sending his word to them. He was holding on to them uh, and holding on to those who represented him. Uh, they were secure in him, regardless of what was going on in the, the Roman Empire at that time. Uh, but uh, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Uh, of course, a phrase that's used, very much famous from Hebrews. Uh, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, the word of Jesus, uh, a word that can create, a word that can encourage, but a word that can destroy everything that is false, that reveals truth uh, and that uh, re reveals uh, falsehood as well, exposes falsehood, exposes deception, separates the two, 
But uh, Martin has been praying uh, you know, about the, the, perhaps a lot of the deception that goes on uh, in this country. And actually within the church, the, the word of Jesus can see, reveals that, separates it, uh, and exposes what is false, and upholds what is true, encourages and uh, blesses and creates uh, as well, of course, where it is... Uh, uh, where it, in our lives the, the word of God uh, upholds us and uh, builds our lives, builds up our spirits. And his countenance was like that, uh, um, like the sun shining in all his strength. Seen as uh, giving a picture of an outstanding glory, uh, Outstanding splendor uh, that uh, this person just radiated glory. Uh, uh, other worldly leaders and kings and uh, uh, very much a uh, media personnel these days uh, try and uh, promote themselves with pomp and ceremony and uh, make themselves out to be... Uh, Perhaps more than they are sometimes, but uh, make uh, an occasion or around them great. But true glory is only in the purpose things of God, and that real glory lies with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, true glory and splendor are His and everything that surrounds Him. But in spite of all that, we read that this loyal old apostle John just falls before him and uh, Jesus reaches out his right hands and says, do not be afraid. He's also the Lord of compassion, the King of compassion, the King of love, the King that says to his beloved and his faithful, do not be afraid. Out of his grace, he has reached out to us, reached out to us and redeemed us. Out of his grace, he reaches out us to uphold us as we fall. Out of his grace, he, he reaches out to reassure us when we, we're fearful, when we, we feel lost. This incredible king is also the king of love and the king of compassion. But he I said, uh, I am he that lives. I was dead, but behold, I live forevermore. And I have the keys to Hades and to, uh, of death and to of Hades. This is the king that, like no other, has overcome death. All earthly uh, beings and all earthly monarchs are no different to that. They will die. Their reigns will be uh, brought to an end, uh, however good or however bad they have been. But Jesus, the one that in a way had to begin his reign by dying for others to redeem us and to establish his kingdom, it's the one that has overcome death. The one that holds the key to, to Hades. That can release the, the, the claim of Satan upon us. That can redeem us and set us free to become his children. To become part of his kingdom. And uh, to live and to reign with him in eternity forevermore. What a king. What a king. So, the one true eternal king who we can bow before, the one that would reach out in compassion and say, do not be afraid, enter my kingdom. And live with me forevermore. May we be encouraged and challenged to worship 
and to honour this wonderful, remarkable king. A king like no other that died to save his people, that overcame death and lives forever. At the moment, before the throne of the Father, to be our high priest, our intercessor, our advocate and our, high, our, our shepherd, but who will one day, maybe one day soon, return to bring his kingdom to this earth.